Okay. Um, so welcome everybody again uh, to today's session, which the Open Access Books Network is hosting on how open access associations are supporting uh, open access book publishing. Um, today we're going to be hearing from the Open Institutional Publishing Association, who are based in the UK, uh, NUP, who are the National or Netherlands University Presses, um, and the Irish Open Access Publishers. Um, we're going to hear from the uh, speakers who are going to present about their association. Then we're going to have uh, a, a discussion between the associations, moderated by myself, and then we'll have uh, open questions from the floor uh, for anything you would like to ask. Um, and without further ado, I will introduce the first speakers, who are the Open Institutional Publishing Association, based in the UK. So on the call, we've got Dominique Walker, who is the Publishing Officer for the Scottish Universities Press, a fully open access and not-for-profit press managed by 19 university libraries across Scotland and Northern Ireland. Uh, prior to this role, Dominique worked for 12 years at the University of Glasgow Library in the Acquisitions Department, working with access to electronic books and journals, transformative agreements and helping researchers publish open access. Paula Kennedy is Head of Publishing at the University of London Press, which is a predominantly open access publisher with a mission to open up humanities research. Before joining UOL Press in 2021, Paula worked for academic publishers, including Palgrove Macmillan, where she was the Global Head of Humanities in the Scholarly Division, as well as publisher for Literature and Theatre and Performance Studies. She's also worked in roles aligned to humanities research outside academic publishing, um, including the Head of Creative Arts and Digital Humanities at the Arts and Humanities Research Council, and as a freelance impact consultant for humanities departments across several UK universities. So without further ado, Paula and Dominique, I'll hand over to you. Okay, let me just share my slides. Um, okay, does that look okay, Lucy? Yes, it does. Thank you. Brilliant. Okay, so thank you very much, um, everybody. So we are going to be talking about the Open Institutional Publishing Association and how we are establishing a, a brand new community of this. <clears throat> so firstly, I'm going to talk through a little bit of background to the association, uh, and then I'm going to pass over to Paula He's going to look at what we've achieved so far, some of our challenges and also looking to the future. So one of our first tasks as an association was to define what we uh, mean by open institutional publishers. So there's been a real uh, kind of growing focus at UK universities on the discussion around open access publishing, what it means um, and how universities can support this. Uh, and in practice, um, this has meant an increase in open access publishing activity at the institutions themselves. Some of this uh, has been formalised, as we can see in the kind of increasing number of new university presses over the last few years, but some of it is kind of less formal, such as providing in-house infrastructure for journals, uh, using repository tools to support publication and kind of individual journals run by departments, for example. So um, this range of publishing activity shows the different ways UK universities are looking to support the move to open access. And all of these we think are equally as important as the other. So um, as an association, we want to be open as, as open as we can to cover all types of institutional publishing, trying not to be too restrictive. So involving anybody, all publishing that takes place within an HEI, no matter how small scale, as well as those who are interested in setting up publishing activities or wanting to explore their options. So while it is a very diverse landscape, there are some key things that do unite us as a community. So our members are all based within the university. They're either born or striving for open access. Um, all of our members are not for profit. Um, and we think we're led by the community. So led by that academic community, as well as being very mission driven. So we're really seeking to bring about change in the academic publishing um, kind of landscape by championing uh, principles and ethics in publishing over revenue, generation and profits, trying to provide that alternative to commercial publishing and building that fairer, more equitable, inclusive and diverse publishing ecosystem. So why did we think there was a need for a new association? So there are lots of publishing associations already, both nationally and internationally, but some of the publishing activity that we've been seeing institutions falls outside the scope of these, um, especially I think the less formalized maybe hosting services, individual journals and institutions who are just thinking about starting doing something. Costs to some of the associations um, can be quite prohibitive for small operations, or maybe we don't meet the membership criteria fully. We also thought that a UK focus um, was quite important as um, each country, I think, faces their own kind of unique set of challenges specific to their own institutions. So for the UK, we've got things like the REF and our particular funder policies. And as I mentioned earlier, the community has been growing very quickly. 
from a Scottish university press perspective, you know, we're a very new press. We've been talking to individual institutional presses about how they set, set up their own presses on a very kind of informal ad hoc basis. And we know that other presses were doing the same thing, um, asking for help or sharing best practice quite informally. So we felt the need for a more kind of formal support mechanism um, for bringing together a community of peers that share similar beliefs, similar motivations, and a community of practice um, that allows for collaboration and sharing, um, but also allows us to have a collective voice and um, that allows us to be part of the wider conversation on open access publishing. And this links into some of the challenges that we face um, as members in general. Often we're quite small scale operations with limited kind of staff numbers, Often we have quite tight budgets, but also operating within institutions who are sometimes not used to running publishing services. And um, there can be misunderstandings or it can take quite a long time for things to happen or um, to be approved. We also face challenges when it comes to engaging the academic community with open access uh, and what we're trying to achieve, which can tie in with kind of low levels of influence that we have kind of individually in the wider landscape. So to try and combat some of these challenges, in June 2022, an initial group of presses were brought together by Graham Stone at JISC to start the conversation on what we could do to support this landscape um, and if an association could work. And we quickly agreed on a community of practice as a good way forward. Uh, we were really hugely influenced actually by the o Irish open access publishers that are also speaking today on, on the webinar. So we continued then to meet throughout 2022 to develop our draft terms of reference, our membership criteria, and to determine what, we, determine what we wanted to achieve. We had a soft launch at the UKSG conference back in April 2023, and that went alongside a JISC blog post that contained an expressions of interest form to try and um, see if there were any interested potential members out there who would like to get involved. We then held an introductory meeting in July 2023 for those that expressed interest in joining. And that was a really great conversation, actually, because it allowed them to kind of feed into what we should do as an association and what we should focus on, because we were very keen not to set anything in stone before the association had been a bit more formalised and we had some official uh, members. Then over the summer, we opened up for um, membership. We had application process started and we held that first OIPET meeting in November 2023. And Paula's going to talk a bit more about um, what we've achieved in just a moment. But on this slide, you can see our current members. We are now up to 19 members, our re most recent uh, member being the Open Library of Humanities. And lastly, I just want to emphasise again that kind of variety of publishing initiative that we've got involved in the association. We kind of cover book, journal, textbook publishing. We also have a very wide range of different publishing models. So we do have book processing charges, we have non-BPC models, we've got collective funding, institutional support, library support. But what unites them all is they are all uh, not for profit. We also have a very wide breadth of subject areas covered, um, we've got spanning the arts and humanities, social sciences, health and psychology. Uh, and we did gather a few statistics for Open Access Week last year, which may be slightly out of date now, but kind of gives you an idea of our kind of collective power, I suppose, when we put together what we've been doing. So we found that we've published uh, 550 books, uh, 70 journals, which will be more now since Open Library of Humanities have joined, um, and our collective downloads were at around um, 14 million in October 23. So just to say, kind of when you put everything we're doing together, how that does make us come a bit stronger. But I'll pass over to Paula now, who'll talk a bit more about what we've been doing. There. Thanks, Dominique. Okay. Um, so Dominique's talked a bit about how and why OIPA was set up. I'm going to talk about our aims, some initial achievements and challenges we've had, and some future plans. So as Dominique said, the main aim of OIPA is really to establish a community of practice to foster collaboration, knowledge sharing, and training across its members. We've outlined on the slide some of the ways OIPA will do this, for example, through sharing information and resources across the publishers involved. And it's been great already to see people using the new network to ask each other questions and offer informal support and advice to fellow members. We also think there might be opportunities to work collaboratively across the group, especially given many OIPA members are small and don't necessarily have dedicated staff in particular publishing functions. So perhaps joint marketing activity or conference attendance or working together on potential funding initiatives. Dominique mentioned that we want to use OIPA as a vehicle for amplifying the voice of smaller non-profit publishers and raising visibility about what we do in discussions about open publishing. This couldn't be more timely in the UK, particularly given the new UKRI OA books policy and the current REF 2029 open access consultation. 
And we're already engaging with both UKRI and the REF team about their new and proposed open access policies and how they might be implemented and their effect on smaller non-profit publishers. Dominique, are you okay to click through? Thanks. Um, so we formed an interim committee in 2023 to help steer the association in its initial phase, whose members you can see on the slide. We've been keen to ensure committee members, um, the roles can be shared, particularly given challenges with capacity for many OIPA publishers. We're planning on holding elections for the committee this summer, with the new committee elected for a two year period and hopefully in post by the autumn. Next slide, Dominique. So the slide um, outlines some of our achievements so far, including practical things like the development of terms of reference for the group and the creation of a JISC OIPA mailing list, a dedicated team site and our Twitter account. We also won a UKSG Innovation Award earlier this year, which is funding our first OIPA symposium on the 10th of June at the University of York. This is a way of bringing OIPA members and those interested in institutional open access publishing together in person. It's free to attend, and I think registration is still open, though numbers are limited. So please do check the OIPA website for more information if you're interested in coming along. We've also created two working groups initially on priority areas that were identified by our members. One on skills, including topics where training needs have been identified, um, which may hopefully include a forthcoming session on best practice and metadata, and a second working group on advocacy. We've also developed a logo, branding, and a new website, which helped to launch OIPA officially during Open Access Week last, last October, with some financial support for this from the School of Advanced Study at the University of London, which is my institution. This was one-off funding, which moves us on to some of the challenges we have. Uh, next slide, please, Dominique. So the funding from my institution helped us work with an external partner on the initial creation of our OIPA website. But with limited capacity across OIPA members, it can be difficult to keep this updated and have time to think about how we develop it to use it to its full potential. There's a real range of different publishing operations involved in OIPA, but many of our members are just one or two people and in very small teams working on OIPA activity alongside demanding jobs. And this can be very difficult. I know I speak for others on the committee when I say this. We can see lots of opportunities for how OIPA could help uh, offer guidance on open access publishing, not just to OIPA members, but also to academics, learned societies, libraries and research office staff, all navigating a changing publishing landscape. But there is a limit to what we can do practically without dedicated and sustainable administrative or financial support. And although there are many areas where the ability to speak as one voice collectively is very useful, the different types of publishing operation involved in OIPA and the different funding models they use means that this has been difficult on occasion and sometimes we have to encourage individual presses to speak up instead which brings us back to the issues around capacity and time again next slide dominique so on to future plans um we've listed here a few of our immediate plans including the creation of an advisory board to support oipa in its work and offer oversight and potentially the creation of future working groups in key areas we're also working at the moment on creating a resource which captures the publishing options which OIPA members offer. It's becoming increasingly clear that finding non-profit open access publishers is difficult for academics and universities that have little time to do this. We think a resource which outlines the various book series, journals, subject areas, publishing formats offered by OIPA members and the high quality of these publications will be helpful for librarians, research office staff and pot potentially Jessica and UKRI and giving them somewhere to steer academics looking for this information. We also think there may be opportunities to extend our network. Uh, we currently offer two tiers of membership. Um, for four members, it's um, any publishing operation linked to a university, um, but we also have associate members who are kind of interested stakeholders. And it may be that learned societies and other scholarly organizations involved in open access publishing might also benefit from this kind of network. There's lots of overlap, I think. Next slide, Dominic. Thanks. So I'm aware this is a very quick overview of OIPA and what we're doing. So if you do have any questions after the webinar today or just want some more information about what we're doing, please do get in touch. Our details are on the slide. One of the main reasons of creating OIPA was to stop smaller presses and publishing operations having to individually reinvent the wheel with aspects of open access publishing each time. And it'd be really great to think about how the associations today might work with the OABN to do the same thing. I look forward to the discussion. Thanks. Thanks, Paula. Uh, and thanks, Dominique. I think the the point that you raised particularly about resources and time and having a lot more ambitions than either of those things sort of resonates with me and probably with Silke and Andrea as well as we coordinate the, the OABN. 
Um, so next we're going to hear from the National or Netherlands University Presses. Uh, Natalia Grigerczyk has been the director of Diamond Open Access Radboud University Press in the Netherlands since 2021. Um, is she? Oh, yeah, you are. Uh, we, she established and shaped the press, uh, crafting its strategic policies and fostering strong collaborations with other Dutch university presses. Prior to her current role, she held the position of director at Radboud University Library for a decade. She's initiated and managed several strategic open access programs on national and international levels and was responsible for the comprehensive transition from the traditional to the digital university library. And Marguerite Niebel is project manager and head of the University of Groningen Press. Marguerite is an educationalist and has led various projects within the university library, including setting up the university press in 2017 and further developing it as a diamond open access university publisher. Since 2023, she's also been a board member of the Association of European University Presses, the AEUP. Uh, thanks both, I'll hand over to you. Can you see it? Yes, I can see it, thanks oh, for so thank you for the opportunity to share the information on Dutch uh, university presses. As a starting network of university presses in the Netherlands, we have not yet decided on our name and we do welcome any suggestions on it. We have an acronym already, which we will likely keep. It's NUPs, and this can stand for Netherlands university presses, or new university presses, meaning we all operate on the same new principles distinct from traditional university presses values. So what principles connect us? Diamond open access, high quality of publications, copyrights on article or monograph belong to the authors, the journal title and archive rights belong to the editorial board or the scientific society. There must be a connection between the author of the book or editor of the journal and their own university. And this connection is different in different university presses ranging from the offer being employed now by the university uh, to simply having graduated from this university in the past. We have diversity in publication types. So we have books, popular scientific and purely scientific books. Uh, and in most cases with peer review, we have textbooks, we have journals, and in some cases, student journals. And we have diversity in disciplines covering all fields represented uh, at the respective universities. Uh, who is participating? We have Leiden, Maastricht, Tilburg, Radboud in Nijmegen, Delft and Groningen. And Leiden does not yet fully align with our principles, but we expect that Leiden will also adopt the diamond model in the future. Uh, the presses are at different levels of maturity, size and development. And naturally we hope and it it's likely that nearly all Dutch universities will have their own Diamond University Press and be part of the NUP network in the future. Our history started about two years ago when we first came together um, and it quickly be became clear that we had many common topics to discuss, like how do you organize peer review? Do you provide the layout of journals? Uh, how do you organize printing on demand and international delivery? Uh, how do you collaborate with other departments of the university and so on and so on. And we realized directly that this was a highly ambitious and enthusiastic group that needed its own community. All of us are positioned within the library, but the library has traditionally been focused on information for the reader, for the consumer. A press, however, is not only a new task for the library, but also has a new target audience, the authors and editors. And of course, these are the same people who write and read, but their needs in these processes are entirely different. 
So the university presses felt a bit lonely within the library environment, and this explains the need for our, our own specific community, which we have found in NUPs. In these two years, we have converged into concrete projects and plans. And realizing our plans has become easier because in the Netherlands, the government has now provided subsidies specifically for open science, including university presses for 10 years, like subsidizing the infrastructures, shared services, and potentially extra capacity. For example, which things we can organize centrally in the Netherlands and which must be done within our own institutions. And these funds will certainly accelerate our projects. Currently, we are working on a joint catalog of NUPs and more on this will be in a minute. Uh, exploring a shared publishing platform for books and textbooks, exploring semi automatic journal formatting through the XML process, establishing a collaboration framework for a new piece, like should it be association network, foundation, community of practice, etc., and to determine projects and regular cooperation, and how we as an organization will, will relate to our environment like own university, library association, university association, etc. In addition to these projects in the Netherlands, we also feel the need for exchange at the European level. And some of us are already members of AEUP. And I personally look very much forward to the insights from this webinar specifically. And one of our projects already has the potential for broader collaboration. And uh, Margreet Nieborg, my colleague from Groningen, will provide a lot of details on it. Margreet. So, thank you, Natalia, for, um, for the introduction. Um, we thought that it would be nice to have um, a showcase that we could show you where we uh, are working on. And uh, next slide, uh, Natalia. One of the uh, of the the, the uh, projects that we are working on is actually a stepping stone for a bigger one. If you can click uh, on the slide again, and next one also. Um, this project is a stepping stone for a bigger one that we aim to get funding for, for the National uh, Committee on Open Science, what Natalia also mentioned. These fundings will be available in 2024 and 2025. And um, we are, for this project, we are in the preparation phase, which includes the developing of a proof of concept. And that means that we are working on the idea of a joint catalog to see if it's doable. Um, it's an online database that anyone can access where you can find all the open access books published by these presses. And this includes uh, scientific peer reviewed books, but also the non peer reviewed books and the popular science books, uh, books that are written with um, uh, teachers and students or are edited by uh, professionals and written by students but also textbooks, especially the open textbooks, dissertations, and other special publications. Um, the catalog will also feature both books that are already published and those who are announced are coming soon. And next one. And next one. Uh, the objectives uh, actually is for the joint catalog is to make the uh, university presses more visible and help more people to find and use our publications. It will act as a showcase for our work of the university presses and serve as a platform to promote these new books. And the university, uh, the joint uh, catalog will also be a clear example of the university presses working together and could become a key feature for the joint website we are currently developing. And it also will helpfully uh, help uh, scholars recognize the UP's contributions because what was already mentioned before that it's 
not only for our side that we need to have the infrastructure and all the cap uh, capacitability uh, in place, but we also need to have a culture shift among the researchers um, towards open access and that open access is not an inferior way of publications. And it can help if we could be easily find and um, that we can see what we can do uh, as university presses together. And also, and that's not the, even the, the least important um, criteria, it will also help us to manage the metadata for the books easier and more efficient, because that's also a challenge um, to see how we can standardize the metadata. Uh, next. And again, next, yeah. Uh, the first thing that we are going to do is uh, setting up, uh, we are going to look at different systems to see what works best. Uh, right now, TOAD uh, seems to be the best option. It's an open source system developed by the scholarly led consortium within the COPIN project. And TOAD is a non-for-profit organization in the UK and uh, is, has a lot of expertise on open metadata management and disseminations but also they uh, are fully equipped to uh, handle open access book for nonprofit scholarly publishers. So this plan for now focuses on using TOADS, but if we find a better system during our explanation, exploration, we will adjust our plans uh, accordingly. Uh, next. Um, then uh, the, um, let me see. Uh, for us, it, it's really important to set up a few basic uh, uh, criteria and essential criteria for the software we choose. Um, for us, it is already uh, clear that it should be open source and uh, maybe community driven or community led uh, open source software. And uh, that we already uh, encountered some difficulties um, to our uh, quiz, for instance. Uh, we are now already using Pure. And when we started with Pure, it was a really nice small Danish uh, company who uh, did this quiz. But in, a, I think we were three years going working with Pure and then it was bought by Elsevier. And now all our data is in the hands of Elsevier and I don't think that's the best place that it should be. So this is something that we want to avoid by setting up um, a joint catalog. So that's why we are looking for a specialty for an open source uh, uh, software. Um, using the joint catalog, uh, we want to use it as a main database for our metadata to help us organize everything more uh, efficiently and also standardized. And the data, central database cannot only uh, use the, uh, uh, it's in use for the joint uh, catalog, but also for the individual catalogs of the European uh, presses, of the university presses. Uh, for example, uh, you can find a joint catalog and scholarly led if you want to see how it looks like, or maybe you already know it. Um, the idea is that the central database can export the metadata to all the platforms like OAPEN, DOB, Project Moose, GStore, and it makes for us easier to share the books widely. And uh, we hope it can also be used for digital archiving in partnership, for example, with the Dutch uh, Royal Library, as Toad is already in uh, contact with various national libraries. But individual publishers also can choose to outsource some of their work to TOAD as it also offers paid services. Next. Uh, what I said already that uh, we are still um, in the preparation phase and it's actually a proof of concept project. It's all about testing if the joint catalog will work in a, uh, in a test setup. And we will mainly look at the metadata we have and we need or we want to have, uh, how we create this and enter this metadata, what technical needs uh, for the technical for the catalog should be there, uh, like hosting and maintenance. And this project will also fig help us figure out the details for a new and bigger project. Um, just a quick rundown of the steps that we are going to take. Um, what I said, we are now in the preparation phase. So we are now gathering technical and functional requirements 
and uh, also exploring some of the different systems. Um, then we are going to work on the metadata. We will identify which metadata we have, what we need and what we want to have and create a survey to collect it. Uh, we're going to look at the technical requirements. Um, we'll specify the database, the hosting options and the test environment setup. And in the test, uh, we will set up the chosen system with uh, the collected metadata. And in the last phase, we will analyze the test results and decide on the next steps. And hopefully, uh, this, um, this will also give us a no or go no if all the uh, if everybody is satisfied about the chosen uh, systems, we can draft up a grant proposal to set up the catalog. And that was, uh, I wanted to tell you about one of our systems. If you want to hear anything about us more, you please can contact us. And of course, because we are all about uh, creative commons, we even creative commons this <laughs> part of our um of our uh, lecture. <laughs> Next. Thank you very much, Natalia and Marguerite. It was uh, really interesting and, and useful to see some of the different ways in which um, associations can be helpful, the shared infrastructure, for example, but then also, as you mentioned, you know, the kind of culture shift that you're trying to create and the, the power of getting together in numbers and demonstrating uh, the work that you're doing. And um, so last but certainly not least, uh, we have Joanna Archbold from Irish Open Access Publishers. Um, Joanna is the director of the IOAP and she leads the Atlantic Technological University Library at ATU Sligo and ATU St Angela's. She's a librarian and an 18th century book historian with over 15 years of experience in research, academic libraries, research funding and creative enterprise. Joanna has published on her historical and library research interests, received research funding and spoken nationally and internationally on a wide variety of topics. She's an active member of the Library Association of Ireland on the LAI Library Island Week Task Force and the LAI's IFLA Library Map of the World project, which is a tool that su supports global library advocacy, highlighting the impact and potential of libraries in delivering the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, Joanna, please go for it. Thank you so much, Lucy. And uh, can I just say before I uh, share an absolute pleasure to listen to colleagues uh, and uh, hear about all the great work that's going on. I certainly found it really inspiring and lots of ideas uh, floating around. So thank you to colleagues uh, and thank you to Lucy and the team uh, for putting this together. Uh, I'm going to share my screen and uh, I take it from there. Lucy, can you confirm that you can see that? Yes, I can. Lovely. Okay. I think I'm echoing a bit here, but my apologies. I'm floating around Trinity here. Um, so colleagues, thank you so much for the invitation and to the previous speakers. Um, I'm here on behalf of the Irish Open Action Publishers. And the more I talk about this, I realize we're missing a, like a network or a group or a gang or a crew or something at the end of that. Um, so I, I have empathy for colleagues who are still figuring out their name. We're more than a year in and I think we've some work to do on that one. But this is where we are. Um, so this is a group a little bit different again from some of the others, even the one that we may have had part of inspiring, uh, but Graham has certainly inspired us as well. Um, so happy to share that uh, with you today. Um, uh, just bear with me, I get this, yeah. Uh, so just to give it a, a little bit of scene setting here, uh, and I, I, I like this quote because uh, it's quite recent, but also it, it's coming from two of our founders. So while I'm the director, um, it was originally founded by two colleagues uh, who can't be with us today, but uh, many of you will know Jane Buckle and Marie O'Neill, two absolute uh, inspiring uh, library colleagues in Ireland and they ran uh, our set up or founded and, and ran the IOP, IOP and then asked me to come in on the director role but they're very much um, in the background and this just explains some of the, the impetus uh, and really it is this idea that uh, there was a real sense that while open access as a movement was growing and understanding was growing, certainly not there by any stretch of the imagination, um, but, but that you really are seeing a commercialising of open access in a way that is absolutely the antithesis of what we're actually looking for. Um, so this idea that the predominance of commercial publishers and this idea of gold open access really isn't isn't getting uh, at what we were looking for here. And, you know, I've spoken to some of these publishers and said, lads, you've literally just commercialised open access and they just kind of go, 
yeah, uh, you know, so uh, it's like these kind of strategies just get ahead of the the, the intent very quickly. Um, uh, and so then you get this situation where commercial publishers um, uh, are really dominating the market and then smaller publishers and then particularly the idea of scholar led or, or uh, uh, learning societies uh, become unviable or just seem like not the option. Um, uh, and this is kind of where we were coming from, and particularly my colleagues Jane and Marie, with some of the, the starting points here for the IOIP. Um, so just a, directly a little bit about it. So it's the Irish Open Access Publishers Group or network or whatever you want. So it's just IOAP. And uh, this is from our website. We're doing a redesign at the moment, but essentially you'll get at it. Um, and it really is the focus in the first instance is uh, about promoting awareness and growing and understanding and building a community around diamond uh, as a model uh, though not to the to total uh, disregard of any of the other models um, and, and really this idea of a kind of a bibliodiversity in a kind of broad sense uh, and trying to demonstrate where and how and uh, in what circumstances uh, you know diamond could be applicable uh, for lots of different uh, uh, people who want to engage in publishing at, at, at different types of publishing or, or uh, methods of publishing. So then a little bit broader, there's that kind of mission piece, which is what, kind of really what I've spoken about. And I'm going to touch on this a little bit about what we're actually, uh, as a group, what we are. Um, but it really is about knowledge sharing and growing awareness, running events. Um, we've just had our first annual awards. Um, uh, engaging as broad a kind of set of actors as we can, but I think I think the nuance between us and some of the other bodies we've we've heard from so far is that we don't formally claim to represent any particular institutional publishers and stuff. And I think that's that's a route we might go down. But at the moment, it very much was community of practice from practitioners, and um, but not necessarily there as an institutional representative. If 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 you get what I'm saying there. So I want to just go in a little bit more and tell you just a tiny little bit more about our background. And some of this is just to give a bit of kudos to some of the early pioneers in Ireland on uh, in libraries, particularly in terms of publishing. So as uh, maybe surprisingly enough, to some degree, this particular group anyway, came from a publishing, a library publishing house uh, that was set up in a private uh, university. Um, but again, that's a marker of some of the people behind it. So just very briefly to say um, Dublin Business School, which is a, a private uh, school, um, but their librarians were extremely innovative um, and they were allowed to run with it. Uh, and they set up their own uh, journal, uh, Studies in Arts and Humanities, back in 2015. And then the the kind of uh, uh, the impetus for uh, a real kind of engagement in the national and particularly the international uh, scholarly uh, the kind of library led scholar led publishing uh, came from that, uh, and then that is where the 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 IOAP started. So our colleagues, a lot of people involved in the IOAP have uh, been involved uh, uh, since the start in the IFLA uh, secret special interest group in library publishing. Um, that's been going since 2018. And if anybody uh, hasn't been aware of that group, um, we'd strongly recommend to look it up um, and connect with them and some great resources available there as well. Um, so just doing a shout out for that if anybody hasn't been there. Uh, and then just to flag, Again, for people who may be kind of coming into this field uh, and are interested in understanding uh, some kind of key documents and principles that might might be a, a good starting point or good uh, bedtime reading material or something, we just want to take the opportunity to share the Forest Framework for Values Driven Scholarly Communication uh, and uh, also the Library Publishing Coalition's an Ethical Framework for Library Publishing. So this is the idea if you if you if you are or if you're looking to uh, step establish whether it's as library as publisher and uh, that's kind of where a lot of our um, team involved in IOAP are coming from and looking to develop even if they're not quite there yet um, so I think these are hugely valuable documents that we want to kind of highlight to the group in this room today so in terms of IOAP and what we're trying to do, we really are that idea of the community of practice uh, and, and kind of drawing on that Wagner idea Wagner, uh, idea of community practice and kind of connecting between the domains of uh, uh, kind of shared knowledge and interest, particularly uh, kind of key understandings of shared issues, even if not all of the circumstances are exactly the same in, in your jurisdiction or, or your institution uh, or how the publishing kind of uh, 
um, context are in your institution, uh, that idea of community and um, building relationships uh, and having platforms for discussion uh, uh, and then also this idea of practice uh, which is particularly around sharing knowledge uh, methods stories we're not quite at the tools yet uh, but we may get there so just to kind of give you a conceptual model of where we're coming from um, to put a bit of context on where we what we're drawing from a lot of you will be very familiar for the uh, science europe uh, diamond open access plan so again, just taking the opportunity uh, to highlight that here and um, for this group, this if we were talking about European context, uh, this is what's informing us and then I'll get to the national context as well. But just to pull out um, again an understanding here, uh, particularly around diamond uh, and particularly about this idea of practitioners or even potential practitioners kind of coming together. Uh, and this, this we feel like represents where the IOAP uh, is coming from. So that idea of community and collaboration uh, needs to be at the heart of Europe's vision for Diamond. Many people in the room will probably have heard that, that kind of the sense coming from Europe that there probably is enough money uh, so circulating in scholarly publications, but it's going in the wrong directions. Uh, and uh, it's through community and collaboration that that might be solved and the infrastructure put in place to help solve some of that. Uh, and we're not saying we never want to work with uh, commercial publishers, but um, it, the traffic is way too much one way and way too much money and all the rest of it, you know. Um, so just to read the quote there, a scholarly publishing infrastructure that is equitable, community driven, uh, I think that's where a lot of people in this room would be coming from. Academic led or scholar led and kind of owned within the kind of uh, research community to allow us to take charge uh, of the scholarly communication system by and for research communities because it really feels like a uh, corporate strategy got ahead of us, uh, basically got way ahead of us um, and uh, games the system uh, and this is where we are now. Um, so that's quite inspiring and that's what we're trying to do. Uh, oh, sorry, excuse me. In terms of the national context in Ireland, just to share this, because I'm not sure how many of you would be familiar with this. Um, we've had discussions with our own board in the IOAP of, of how valuable this is or not. I think there's nobody saying it's not valuable, um, but how valuable and uh, you know how much money comes behind it. But essentially we have a target in Ireland, a national target set by the government that says by 2030, which is not that long away, and this isn't like a totally unique or anything. There is others who have set similar, um, but it's not universal either. That by 2030, 100% of uh, publicly funded research publications, uh, and they're not particular uh, about, you know, they just, it's research publications, um, should be available open access. Now, it doesn't go into Diamond or anything like that, uh, and it doesn't necessarily pay at what cost, you know, uh, of this or anything like that. So, um, but it's still a very interesting target and it focuses the minds. And when it's referred to, then it allows you to kind of connect what you're doing just to, uh, at, whether it's at an institutional level or at a, a regional or organizational level, it allows you at least to refer to a clear national target and that this isn't just going to happen in 2030 there's steps to this there's kind of progression that needs to be made and um, so this is quite useful um as something to have uh, and like i said it does focus the minds a little bit because it, the question is how are we going to get there how much are we prepared to pay for it how much needs to be related to infrastructure to facilitate this. And then there's obviously a huge culture conversation, um, but it does keep the funders a little bit focused as well on how we're gonna manage this. Um, so that's a really important Irish context for this. Uh, we have had some good national conversations uh, since about 2017 through the National Open Research Forum, but really the idea of diamond in that conversation has only come in in the last year or so. Uh, so there's still work to do there. So uh, in terms of the IOAP itself, uh, we have a, a team and I've linked the team there. I'm not, not flagging the team, uh, but just wants to flag, we have a really incredible and hugely valuable for us a board, advisory board, who we meet with, with probably two to three times a year. Uh, and Graham, who I know is in the audience, it, it, it is on that. Some of you will recognize people there. We just put the pictures because it's easier. But um, Neve Brennan is a, an Irish evangelist at Trinity uh, 
for all things IOAP and open access and has been for like 20 years. Just flag a few others. Uh, Jan Eric, who's up at the Arctic University of Norway and one of the co-leads with Graham on the Dymos project. Um, uh, Sonia Betts uh, is based over uh, Head of Library Publishing at the University of Alberta. Uh, who else is there? I'm just trying to think who really for uh, Bernie Fogan here, who is in uh, OASPA. Uh, Judith uh, uh, Barnsby, who's uh, the head of uh, editorial in the DOAJ. Uh, Brandon there is coming from uh, the kind of publishing commissions. Ariana Bacarro Garcia is coming from uh, the State University in Mexico. So we've really gone for uh, an international national group and the way the board has been working for us at the moment has actually been some really um, interesting engaging uh, conversations for the whole IOAP team and giving us that international perspective uh, so that's been a really valuable exercise for us I think there's more we can do with that so if anybody was um, looking to form an association or a group like that I, I think one of our messages would be to think about your networks um, and draw on colleagues. It's hopefully not too much time or too onerous for colleagues to be involved with us, but uh, it makes a huge difference to be able to draw on uh, expertise as you're kind of building and trying to figure out uh, everything that you're doing. I'll just keep going for another minute. Uh, so what do we actually do uh, in the IOAP? I'm going to very briefly have a slide on each of these. Uh, I've kind of touched on the shared vision already. Uh, I may just say one or two other things on that. And I'm just going to just give you an example of a couple of stuff that we do, but don't want to hog the mic if you like. So what do we do? Uh, certainly we keep an eye on the um, big announcements from national international funders. So for example, we would maybe visibly endorse key policies. So the example here of Science Europe's action plan for Diamond OA, uh, we endorsed that in 2022. Uh, and that can be helpful when you're trying to, you know, establish your own national profile and stuff like that as well. Uh, responding then to these national co consultations, the example I gave earlier, uh, uh, the National Open Research um, uh, Plan, there's been a range of activities happening on that since 2017. Um, yeah, and you can see the, the key main points is establishing the culture of open research. So we certainly think we align with that. We're particularly looking at this idea of trying to a challenge and complicate the 100% there go yeah look we support that but at what cost and what kind of open access uh, you know so challenge and complicate a little bit there and then obviously the idea of fair which people would understand as well um, specifically then within North what we're doing is um, since we've been established <coughs> we think a marker of the profile and the contribution we can make is demonstrated by the IOAP is a partner, uh, an associate partner on at least four, uh, <coughs> excuse me, North projects. So North is the name of that National Open Access Research or Open Research Forum projects. And the particular one that might be of interest here, there's a project called Publish OA, which is led by, I think it's Trinity, College Dublin and the Royal Irish Academy and the Royal Irish Academy would be a fairly established academic publisher in Ireland publicly funded as an organization a bit like the Royal Society uh, in uh, England and so they are really looking to understand what a national platform uh, for diamond publishing could look like in Ireland so these are all pilot projects uh, but and, and obviously they're looking at journals, but they are looking at monographs as well. Uh, so this one in particular is very interesting for the kind of theme of where we are today. These are all two or two, three years as pilots. Uh, a lot of it is around um, understanding what's possible and then making recommendations on what does sustainability look like. So the IOAP is kind of formally involved in all of these uh, projects. And uh, the other one, um, that's interesting is this fostering a culture of open research in the humanities and social sciences. So, for example, one of the things that we got through involvement in that was uh, to be able to offer a bursary uh, to a postgraduate student who's interested in this space to go to conferences on this kind of stuff. So we're given the limited time and capacity that we have. We're actually putting our focus into these projects at the moment rather than doing some other things that I think colleagues mentioned there that I'd love to be doing. Um, so that will be where I think we'll see some of the nuances. Um, um, am I, are you okay on time? I'll wrap up now in a minute.
Yeah, another minute or so. Thanks, Joanna. Lovely, thanks. Um, so you can see there's other projects there, but they're probably not as relevant here. So that idea of partnering uh, and uh, being a named partner with big academic institutions, other bodies, um, really helps us to get involved in conversations and hopefully influence um, uh, in lots of ways, particularly in these early days. So the other things we do is to uh, offer uh, action-oriented kind of knowledge sharing events. These are examples of some of our events recently. Um, uh, so discussions around diamond open access publishing, as you can see, uh, monograph publishing in the humanities, which was organized with one of those North projects that we mentioned, and then a DOAJ sprint again to try and get at uh, growing communities of practice and knowledge sharing. Uh, we're also looking to share a little bit more around stories and narratives uh, so that people, particularly academics, can imagine themselves uh, doing this kind of work and understanding why it's valuable. Uh, so that's something we'd like to grow significantly, probably with video content and that kind of stuff as well. Um, uh, so it just put something there specifically on library publishers. So as I said at the start, we are not uh, like, the, like uh, the institution in the UK from the first speakers there. We're not just a collection of library publishers or institutional publishers. Uh, it's more about individuals and uh, people interested in this space and active in this space, but not necessarily on the group as their institutional representatives. And that's, I think, our next step on this. Um, we definitely wanted to be able to recognise the work in Ireland that's happening uh, or uh uh, within institutions within the jurisdiction. Uh, so one of the things we did this year for the first time was the inaugural Open Access uh, Publishers Awards. Um, so that was kind of a really nice uh, initiative. But what I will note, and it gives you a marker of where Ireland maybe is at the moment, we had a category for open monographs. Uh, we had a couple of nominations, but they weren't actually accurate in terms of uh, open monographs, if you like. So we ended up not actually giving an award in that category, whereas we we were able to give awards in the categories of Open Access Journal, um, uh, OER and Outstanding Individual Contribution to this field. So I think that's a marker of where uh, Ireland is. It's growing in the space of open access monographs, but um, it's much stronger in the open access journals, but it could do a lot more in both, if you like. Um, we definitely like to see ourselves as certainly within the team being able to do a bit of horizon scanning and hopefully sharing as much as we can with colleagues. And uh, we do have a listserv uh, and social media and blog posts and all that kind of stuff, but it's about finding capacity for some of these things, but that would be our intent. Just to give you a sense of where Ireland is, uh, in terms of some of the trajectory of what's happened. We have had some institutional libraries uh, publishing particularly open access journals for a while. The numbers are small, like the jurisdiction is small, but the numbers are quite small. It's definitely growing a little bit. Uh, and we do have a formal uh, open university press uh, in the last year uh, in collaboration with uh, UCL. Um, so we'd have publishing groups, uh, both at the national level, uh, but not necessarily specifically open uh, publishing that's the nuance here. Um, you can see we've put the IOAP here shortly after the IFLA uh, group was established and then uh, the other projects that we think are big na national and international projects that are uh, impacting in this space and we put the IOAP. Uh, I, uh, OIPA there as well, just as a matter of interest. Uh, so last slide, challenges, uh, loads. Um, I think the biggest thing listening to colleagues is, like I said, that sense of our membership. We want to do a start doing a formal membership model, um, but in the first instance, it was largely based on people who happen to be in key institutions doing certain things or whatever, but they're not necessarily formally representing the institution. So that's something we need, we are looking at currently. We did decide to focus on the North projects and get involved in those projects because of the nature of the timing on those. We have no funding at all uh, because of the nature of the group. Um, we're looking at that um, for the North projects that we're involved in. It does, it's not coming with formal funding, like specifically to us. It's that we're contributing in terms of organizing events or completing work. And that's how the funding is distributed like that. Time and capacity for everyone involved. Everyone has a day job. Um, as I said, we're not just higher, we're not look, aiming just to talk to people or to publishers who are based in higher institution, higher education institutions. Um, so even the people around the table will be coming from places that might have different funding models. And somebody else mentioned that as well. And everybody there is kind of out of informal interest at the moment. 
just a flag uh, to end on a positive note. And uh, just uh, I noted recently the Spark Europe were uh, put up a post there, obviously about attending the global summit on diamond open access. I really liked this kind of headline here that the, the seed of a global federation for diamond open access has been planted, uh, and I think that's kind of. But most of us are, are, are interested in and seeing it blossom if I can push the metaphor a little bit there uh, and that's how to contact us uh, and again always um, myself or Jane or Marie O'Neill would be a relevant contact for anything here thank you so much uh, for inviting me and for listening to us and looking forward to the conversation Thanks, Joanna. That's great. And thanks to all of our speakers. Um, we've got about 15 minutes now. So if anybody has any questions, please feel free to, to drop them in the chat or to raise your hand, your Zoom hand. Um, I've got a couple of questions, but first, do any of the speakers have questions they'd like to ask each other? I'll give you a moment in case you do. No, Wallace? Good, quick yeah, question. Okay. Yeah. We have conversations within um, OIPA about what we would like to do in the future. And we have lots of ambitions. <laughs> I think you mentioned this, Lucy. I just wondered from the other groups, if funding or time and capacity wasn't an issue, what would be top of your list to focus on? So it's not a straightforward, <laughs> easy question to throw at you. Uh, I might come in on that if that's OK, Lucy. Um. <laughs> To my mind, the, the hearts and minds battle here is with uh, the academics themselves. So if money and time was not an issue for myself or, or any of our team in particular, I would be going on tour, getting down to academics, taking them for lunch, bringing some of our advisory board members and really trying to talk to give them a sense of number one, uh, this is... It, this is good for you uh, for, for in terms of disseminating your research, getting it out there into the public. Uh, the funders are moving in this direction of not giving a hoot about hating hate indexes or you know journal impact factors and stuff like that. And thus uh, dissemination and, uh, and impact are much better served. That this is the right thing to do uh, when we think about the, you know, the kind of elitist nature of uh, access to published research, scholarly published research when it's behind paywalls. Um, so yeah, basically a face-to-face -face, uh, free lunch uh, tour uh, with our amazing team who are so passionate about this stuff that I think if they got in the faces of academics, could convince them with the passion, but also convince them with the, the logic for their own career, and then obviously have the infrastructure and the expertise at their fingertips uh, to help them uh, be able to engage in this and kind of break away from that sense of, well, this is how my professor did it. And, you know, that sense of, well, it's it's worked for us previously, so let's just play the game. Thanks, Joanna. Natalia? Yes, in addition to Johanna, um... Uh, I also would develop um, services, facilities uh, for, for our authors and editors that would be better than what, we, what they get now. Uh, as they uh, get uh, from the commercial publishers, they get, I have to admit, better services or more services than we can afford. Thank you. Um, Carla, go for it. Uh, no, I don't know if you can see the questions and answer thing from Zoom, because there's a question there uh, from Judith Patala. I don't know, sorry, I can't pronounce her name. <laughs> I was just wondering with regard to the open science funding from the government in Netherlands, does that refer to only sciences or humanities as well? And if only science, why? For humanities as well, it's yeah. not restricted to one or some disciplines. No, but the, the key thing is also that um, what was mentioned earlier, that we sometimes worry about that the funds are not going to the right directions. And that's also what was worrying us. And that's why we are um, going ahead a little bit before that the calls are open to prepare some of the propositions and proposals because we have sometimes the feeling that the money is, is going around and there's nothing really practical coming out of it, something that the presses can benefit of. 
it's it's sometimes it's more about and again building an infrastructure and another infrastructure and another infrastructure and um it's not really helping us forward thanks margaret um paula you got your hand up I just wanted to pick up again on what Johanna was saying, because I completely agree about the winning hearts and minds of academics. I think that's something that everyone involved in kind of non-profit open access publishing is really desperately trying to do. And I do wonder if there's kind of potential there for us to work together on that. You mentioned the stories that you're kind of collecting in the narratives. I think that's a really key way of us all being able to kind of, we've got, you know, amongst us, we've got a huge body of work that we can draw on there to do that and with the Open Access Books Network and your publisher, Lucy. So I do think if we could kind of draw that together, that would be fantastic. Can I, yeah. can I say something about that? Um, mm, please do. We, 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 of course, have the same problem about the culture shift. And what we started to do was to find ambassadors uh, in our university and ambassadors that are prestigious researchers already and are already really open for um, open access. And sometimes they can deliver the message much stronger and better than that we can, because they know which language to speak. So that can help also to have a really strong team of ambassadors uh, within your organization. Thanks, Margaret. Um, so one of my questions was, um, I think with any sort of group of different organizations, different sizes, potentially, maybe slightly different focuses, um, I think there can be challenges sometimes in working together as well as advantages to working together. Um, and particularly, I think, Paula, you mentioned the sort of aim to try and speak with one voice. And I think one of the advantages of these sorts of associations is definitely that it can amplify what you're doing. But are there ever any difficulties with that? Are there ever any conflicts or disagreements that need resolving? And how do you go about doing that in your different associations? Yes, <laughs> there are. I mean, I have to say, not hugely and actually it's a really lovely collaboration the association it's been completely joyful to work on but I think things like the ref consultation process for example we we've been discussing whether or not we would have um a collective OIPA response to that and it's not that straightforward because everyone has got different funding models different financial support some presses use book processing charges others don't and so to be able to say with one voice this is what we do we can't really do that. And so we're trying to kind of gather the responses together to see where are the shared areas that we can speak as one on. But it is it takes some time to do that. Again, it's time capacity to be able to focus on that messaging. Thanks, Paula. Um, Any other we, we are, yeah, we are starting uh, now. So we are in a very a fresh stage of our association or network and we didn't have really conflicts or troubles yet. Uh, we are very different, we know this already, so we are looking for things that connect us and we start with those. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, any other comments on that one? Um, so then I had another question, which relates actually to a bit to what jo uh, Joanna was saying about the fact that you had an award for book publishing, but couldn't give it to anyone because there were no sort of eligible applications, which is a shame. Um, so I was wondering, are there specific challenges with supporting open access books within your associations? Do they potentially get squeezed out by journals? Is there other additional or greater challenges with books? Um, or is it actually, you know, there's no no real sort of difficulty or challenge there? I might just come in on that initially to say that our own view was that there definitely would have been books that could have been nominated, you know, open uh, monographs that could have been nominated for this. And we felt as a new organization, we probably just didn't quite get our promotion of the that, you know, that particular part of the awards. Right. Um, and but look, so we would be very much focusing on this next year to make sure that we do get nominations. But I think it still is a it, it is a type of a, a, a reference. All right. Uh, to where the state of the art, if you like, in Ireland. Um, uh, but yeah, so I, I definitely think in Ireland, you could for sure say that it's much more common to have the journals. And then that's some people who might be putting something as a monograph, but actually they're kind of marked 
putting more as an open education resource in a different type of a way, you know. Um, but I do know that a lot of university uh, universities or third level education institutions have recently bought something like press books. So I think we're going to see a lot more textbooks uh, coming out as uh, in that kind of open uh, book format. But whether they kind of the full on humanities you know, monograph side of things or social sciences will come out. It, 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 it remains to be seen, but hopefully that North project will have an impact as well. So that's from my view. Thanks. That's really interesting. I'd, I'd also kind of say that for us, I think there's definitely increasing interest in open educational resources and the textbook side of thing. I think some of the institutions we're talking to who are in, who have joined OIPA because they're interested in setting up a press, that's driving their interest is the kind of ebooks textbook side of things um and so you know that's again on our list of things we'd love to do is to have kind of a group looking at that specifically i don't know if we'll kind of get to that point but i would mention that for us there's so many publishers within oipa who are books focused actually so we don't have the same kind of challenges i think perhaps um i like to think that if we ran a similar kind of awards there would be definite kind of eligible candidates so it'd be really good to learn from your experience johanna about engagement and how you kind of pitched those awards because I, th I think it'd be a fantastic thing to do and there are obviously kind of increasing numbers of awards now for open access books the new ACLS Arcadia award that one of our books was really fortunate to have won recently I think these are doing a great job for raising the profile of open access publishing and the quality of it so I like to think this will change over the next few years hopefully thank you um we also uh, acquired press books uh, two years ago and we started with uh, publishing uh, textbooks and especially uh, it's really very nice to see for, for the journals and for the open access book, uh, especially the arts and humanities are really very interested. And the science and engineering and the medical uh, department, it was much more difficult to get inside the faculty and to raise awareness and interest. But now we are working with textbooks. We see that a lot of interest is building up, especially uh, in the medical and in the science and engineering uh, corner, because they already work a lot with uh, web-based books or MOOCs or online learning, and they are really very interested in open textbooks. So it's also a way of, if you are going to uh, work, want to work with the whole of the university, to promote your open educational resource and textbooks to get the whole inter university interested and not only the arts and humanities. So it can also help you to have your message about open access also into the science and engineering and medical corner. Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, does anybody have any final questions before we close? Either for audience or speakers? OK, um, I am tempted to ask some more, but I know that if I do, we'll go past our closing time. So I will keep them keep them back. Um, but this was a really uh, interesting and useful discussion to have had. Um, thanks enormously to our speakers for persisting through the initial issues that we had and then for delivering some fantastic talks um, and some really interesting reflections at the end there as well. Um, thank you to you, to the audience again for sticking with us despite the uh, the issues and the changing of location um, and for, for coming and supporting what we've done. I hope it was useful and, and interesting for you as well. Um, particular thanks to Carla and Silke for helping us to transition away from the previous channel and get onto a slightly more secure uh, place. Um, the recording of today's event will be available um, soon, uh, probably in the next couple of weeks, and we'll share it via the OABN channels, via our mailing list, via Twitter, um, etc. Um, and keep an eye on what we're doing, because we're going to have more events coming up, we're going to have more blog posts, uh, more resources hopefully to share as well. Um, so thank you all enormously, and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. I hope to meet again. Yes, thanks, thanks everyone. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Bye. It was excellent. Bye.